Our next speaker is Han Soon Seung of East Asian Languages and Civilizations, who will speak to us about textbook enlightenment, Europe, Japan, and the rise of global distance learning, 1720 to 1877. Thanks to Professor Kuriyama for the kind introduction. But most of all, thanks to all of you for coming here today. All of us here are living through an alleged age, a revolution. They say today that you can take a professor, you can put him online, and just by doing so, you can make education truly global, truly universal. You can build a classroom without walls. Now, whether or not all this is actually going to happen or not, I can't say. I'm not a futurist. But I am a historian. And as a historian, my research shows that starting in the 18th century, thinkers, movers, and shakers of all stripes had already begun to say much the same thing. The only difference was that they said it about textbooks. Give a useful te textbook to the simplest of men, and they will learn from it. So said the French philosopher Condorcet in the years of the revolution. But what did he mean by this? Haven't we always learned from textbooks? History, in fact, shows us that this was not the case. The textbook as we know it is a fairly recent invention. It comes into being in the second half of the 18th century, then it rises over the course of the 19th as a new technology. And as a new technology, as all new technologies, the textbook provided society with a new promise and a new hope. The promise that every man, through textbooks, could be their own teacher. No matter who you were or where you were in the world, as long as you had the right textbook, you could all share in the same world of knowledge. It was this, but it was the first real experiment in distance education, the first real attempt to build a classroom without walls. And it's this that my research attempts to trace, trying to understand what effects textbooks had as a global phenomenon in reconfiguring relations between West and East. I start by looking at French and English records from publishers, from charitable societies, from government agencies, all involved in the distribution of textbooks worldwide. But these records here, they can only tell us half the story. The 19th century, for the most part, was an age without much international regulation of copyright. And this meant that it was not only European actors spreading textbooks around the world, but publishers and educators in Asia who took Western books like these and copied them, reprinted them. We find these types of copied materials all across the pedagogical landscape of 19th century Asia. And what this tells us is that what we today would call piracy, what we would brand as illegal copying, was in fact a fundamental and necessary condition of the circulation of knowledge between West and East. But copying is sometimes a strange affair. When knowledge begins to move, it also begins to change. And let me give you one example of what I mean. Consider this primary school textbook in American history. Now, all of you, for one second, are going to move out of your bodies and imagine that you were a 19th century Japanese person reading this for the first time. What would you have thought in learning of the story of Thomas Jefferson, one of our great founding fathers. Do you draw examples from his great deeds, his monumental efforts? Perhaps. But for the average Japanese person in the mid-19th century, what would have interested you more is not the story of Jefferson, but the image of his face. This image struck such a chord by itself in some Japanese readers that they copied it and pasted it into this new diagram to represent the five races of the world. Thomas Jefferson, for an average 19th century Japanese person, 
would have meant less as a statesman and more as a representative face of what it meant to be Caucasian. And if you think that's strange, the story doesn't stop here. This image gained such currency and such popularity in Asia that it too was recopied throughout. And with each copy, minor changes came in. <laughs> the point is this, that by the end of the copying process, you can barely tell what the original was. Copying was also a creative act, an act that created new meanings. Give a useful textbook to the simplest of men, said Condorcet, and they will learn from it. But what he forgot to add was that learning occurs often in strange, new, and unpredictable ways. It's these types of lessons that I think we can apply to our 21st century classroom without walls. So just as we today speak of online technology as creating a new space of knowledge, so too did textbooks as a technology link spaces in Europe to spaces in Asia. So too was the recopying, the reprinting, the pirating of works throughout the 19th century a way in which similar pedagogical materials started to shape a commonality throughout the world. But we must also remember this. But if every man is indeed his own teacher, then what is taught is often not what we originally intended. We must remember that when we take the classroom and break down its walls, we allow knowledge to become unsteady, unfixable. When we set knowledge free, we must also sometimes relinquish our own control. Thank you very much for listening.